Hello, and welcome back to the Poetry Podcast with me, Lance Pearson. I said we would move on to the early 20th century, and we start with our star turn for this programme, Adelstrop by Edward Thomas. I shall start with the poem itself, and then explore why it is so famous and popular. You need perhaps to know that Adelstrop is a real place, a village in Gloucestershire. It used to have a railway station, and although the railway still runs through, the station was closed long since by Dr Beeching. The station name board now sits in the village bus shelter. We've put a photograph of it on our website, the Poetry Podcast with com. The poem records a memorable moment on a real train journey taken by Edward Thomas in 1914. Yes, I remember Adelstrop, the name. Because one afternoon of heat, the express train drew up there unwontedly. It was late June. The steam hissed. Someone cleared his throat. <coughs> no one left, and no one came on the bare platform. What I saw was Adelstrop, only the name, and willows, willow herb and grass and meadow sweet and haycocks dry, no whit less still and lonely fair than the high cloudlets in the sky. And for that minute, a blackbird sang close by, and round him, mistier, farther and farther, all the birds of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. Before we go on to more serious information about the poem, I can't resist treating us to a couple of parodies. My friend Kelsey Thornton, who is a distinguished professor of English literature, has written a whole book with the poem rewritten in the style of 32 other writers. He wittily calls it Adelstrophes, and I have put details on the website. I have chosen the two poets I work most closely with, John Betjeman, and first... Gerard Manley Hopkins. Here is his unexpected sight of Adelstrop. I caught that noontide nothing but the name of Adelstrop, where stopped the non-stop train at the year's centre. Sent my scenting brain no trace or clue that memory can reclaim. Engine and man did one thing and the same, hissed mist from out their pipes. But how explain how stationary the station could remain to lay stress on the sign? For that I came. Codlins and cream, green grass, and all the willows, sweet meadow sweet, hay dry beneath sun's fires, clouds echoing stooks below like silk sack pillows, made hush while blackbird's song set off the choirs that cry their maker forth from hill to hill. Oh, shout wide to Oxford! and its sharing shires. For Hopkins, of course, the poem becomes a sonnet, like so many of his own compositions. Betjeman has no such restriction to fourteen lines, and feels free to indulge his favourite interests along the way. Gaily out of Paddington runs the train we take, drawn by a saint, 
Class 460, smart in Great Western Lake, through Oxford, Yarnton, Charlbury, dear friendly Cotswold names, where some change for Chipping Norton, some for Borton on the Water, or Cheltenham, St. James. But breaking up our peaceful glide across the gentle countryside, something that Bradshaw must have missed when making his most useful list, that quite unprecedented stop of the express train at Adelstrop, where long ago Jane Austen's kinsman Thomas Lee had been the rector of the village church, St. Mary Magdalene, still with its thirteenth-century tower, but heavily restored once in Queen Victoria's reign, twice under George the Third, the sort of place I'd pass on antiquarian afternoons biking round the Gloucester lanes in adolescent Junes. But no one comes to visit here for tea and toast today, no bonnet, chiffon dress, cravat. The guests have gone away, the platform is abandoned, and the station-master's hand refuses to be party to a standstill so unplanned. But I hear a cough. Steam hisses out, though no one comes or goes. Uncompromising orange-black. The enamel advert shows that viral is what young boys need, and girls too, we are told. While stiff, the name of Adelstrop stands firm in Gilsand's bold. Haycocks dot the fields around, and the willow herb grows high, and cloudlets still and lonely fair dapple the bright blue sky. Gold across this sea of silence, from the willow there, like a bell, a blackbird's song, peals on the misty air, and ricocheting their music, all the Oxford birds conspire to form a festive carillon, rippling through Gloucestershire. Well, enough of the fun and games. One of my friends was horrified by the idea of parodying this poem because she finds the original so moving. It's time to ask why. It's all to do, I suggest, with the dates. The date the train stopped, the date the poem was written, and the date it was published. I said the train stopped in 1914. It was June the 24th, to be exact. As far as we know, that is the last date reported in English poetry before the First World War, declared a month later on July the 28th. And this station stop is the second last event immortalised in verse. But Edward Thomas wrote the poem on the 8th of January 1915, after the war had begun. In other words, he is already looking back on an England that, in the event, was never to be the same again. The birds are singing to an idyllic Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire about to be lost forever. It starts in natural, conversational language, which is what Edward Thomas always aimed at. Yes, I remember Adelstrop, he says, as if chatting with us. But then, despite himself, he becomes emotional and poetic in the second half of the poem, as he remembers the meadow sweet and haycocks dry, no whit less still and lonely fair than the high cloudlets in the sky. The treasured but vulnerable landscape is echoed 
in the heavens, the only place where it can survive. And the poem wasn't published, and so not read by anyone beyond immediate friends and family, till late 1917, six months after Thomas himself was shot dead in the Battle of Arras in France. The poem takes its full poignancy and power from that. But why did I say this train journey was the second last event before the war to be recorded in verse? Well, why were Edward Thomas and his wife on that train? They were on their way to Ledbury to stay with their friends Robert Frost, the American poet, and his wife, at that time living in the Herefordshire village Leddington. They were part of a remarkable group of poets centred on the nearby village of Dimmock, just over the Gloucestershire border. As well as Frost, there were Rupert Brooke, Lassells Abercrombie, John Drinkwater, and Wilfred, or W. W. Gibson. That very evening, Gibson and his wife invited them all round to their house for one of their regular evenings of poetry and discussion. He wrote about it in his poem, The Golden Room, which thus becomes the last ever pre-war event, celebrated in verse. Gibson wrote even longer after the event, in 1925. His memory says it was July, but diaries reveal it was actually that same eventful day, June the 24th. Do you remember that still summer evening, when in the cosy cream-washed living room of the old nail shop, we all talked and laughed? Our neighbours from the gallows, Catherine and Lassell's Abercrombie, Rupert Brooke, Eleanor and Robert Frost, living a while at Little Eden's, who'd brought over with them Helen and Edward Thomas. In the lamplight we talked and laughed, but for the most part listened, while Robert Frost kept on and on and on, in his slow New England fashion, for our delight, holding us with shrewd turns and racy quips and the rare twinkle of his grave blue eyes. We sat there in the lamplight, while the day died from rose-latticed casements and the plovers called over the low meadows till the owls answered them from the elms. We sat and talked. Now a quick flash from Abercrombie, now a murmur dry, half heard aside from Thomas, now a clear laughing word from Brooke, and then again Frost's rich and ripe philosophy that had the body and tang of good draught cider, and poured as clear a stream. "'Twas in July of 1914 that we sat and talked. "'Then August brought the war and scattered us. "'Now on the crest of an Aegean isle, "'Brook sleeps and dreams of England. "'Thomas lies neath Vimy Ridge, "'where he, among his fellows, died, "'just as life had touched his lips to song. And nigh as ruthlessly has life divided us who survive, for Abercrombie toils in a black northern town beneath the glower of hanging smoke, and in America frost farms once more. And far from the old nail shop, we sojourn by the western sea. And yet was it for nothing that the little room all golden in the lamplight, thrilled with golden laughter from hearts of friends that summer night. Darkness has fallen on it, 
and the shadow may never more be lifted from the hearts that went through those black years of war, and live, and still, whenever men and women gather for talk and laughter on a summer night, shall not that lamp rekindle, and the room glow once again alive with light and laughter, and like a singing star in time's abyss, burn, golden-hearted, through oblivion. I was introduced to that poem by my friend Christopher Court, who sadly died in 2020. He was a leading member of our poetry enjoyment group in the London borough where I live, and I gratefully dedicate this whole episode to him. We adopted the poem as our motto for the group, seeking to make our monthly poetry readings also a golden room. The poem mentions Robert Frost dominating the conversation, keeping on and on and on, but delighting the others with his turns and quips and twinkling eyes. That August, he and Edward Thomas stayed in neighbouring cottages, and it was then that Frost finally persuaded Thomas to start writing poetry, which up to this point he hadn't done. The poem mentions the cruel irony of Thomas's death, just as life had touched his lips to song. In just over two years, he wrote 144 poems, more perhaps than anyone else has done in such a short period. The two men often went walking together, and their walks in the Gloucestershire and Herefordshire woods gave rise to one of Frost's most famous poems, The Road Not Taken. Its words are well known, but its origin less so. Thomas was notoriously indecisive, and Frost wrote this poem for him, and about him, as a good-humoured joke. The first three verses echo his typical agonising over which choice to make. And then, whether it had been the right one. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And, uh, sorry, I could not travel both and be one traveller. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had worn them really about the same and both that morning equally lay in leaves, no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. <sighs> I shall be telling this with a sigh. Oh. Somewhere, ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less travelled by, and that has made all the difference. At the end of the poem, you hear Thomas's sigh way in the future, still wondering if he'd taken the right path. And in the last two lines, Frost's reassurance <laughs> that he had. It was eerily prophetic. It seems that Edward Thomas took the poem as advice on a much more important crossroads facing him. 
he wondered whether to enlist and fight in the war. Aged nearly forty, he didn't need to, especially as the father of three young children. The more beckoning path would surely have been to stay at home with them. But in solidarity with younger friends, he took the road less travelled by and joined up. Next time we shall come to the war itself and the amazing poetry it generated. We shall hear again from Edward Thomas and we shall meet another of the Dimmock poets, Rupert Brooke, one of the most famous poets and casualties of the war. But that's all for now, folks. If you enjoyed this program or recent ones, perhaps you could give it a rating or review on iTunes, or if you have one, your own preferred podcasting.